watching this and getting, slowing down a little bit, if you can't hear me when I say that, would you just wave like this and I will bring my volume back up. This, uh, uh, Amanda mentioned this is a program that has been around for uh, the monitoring for 12 years, the program 13. Now, I mentioned that, been involved in that from the beginning. I'm going to cover a little bit about black oyster catchers. She mentioned we do training for the beginning. I do a black oyster catcher 101. I'll do an abbreviated version of that this evening, a quick discussion of the project and how we monitor, how we collect our data, and uh, what we do with that data, and some of the analysis and findings and a discussion of that. And I'll see if I can do that within less than an hour. Yeah, those that have heard me talk before, I hear <laughs> laughing. So I'll work, I'm working on this one. Um, again, we'll do an abbreviated version of this, a bridge version of Bloy 101. So what's Bloy? Black oyster catcher. That's the, the um, uh, what's the international organization, or international ornithologist union, those abbreviations for both the scientific name and the common name. Common abbreviation for black oyster catcher is a bloy, and if I say bloy, I'm really meaning black oyster catcher. Um, the scientific name is Hermotopus uh, bachmani, and it's part of a larger family of at least a dozen, well, at one time, a dozen uh, oyster catchers. The name oyster catcher comes from the American oyster catcher, the one on the top there, and most of these oyster catcher species are pied. They're black and white. There are three that are black, and there's one, the middle one here is variable. That, that's another story. That's in New Zealand. It's fun to look at that pair. A little different. Those that, that look at black oyster catchers with their pale feet, these guys, the variable ones, had nice coral color feet. And uh, for those, and I'll mention an eye ring here. Their eye ring is nice and, nice and red, and their, their iris is nice and red, unlike the black oyster catcher. But there are a variety of species number of people are beginning to look at this using mitochondrial DNA studies, and they may start mixing some of these a little bit and changing them. Even the, the extinct one, the Canary Island one, they found really is a subspecies of the Eurasian uh, oyster catcher. So some of this may be changing. Uh, the oyster catcher itself, uh, black oyster catcher, is a keystone species in the upper rocky intertidal communities along the northeastern Pacific. And it's interesting to think of us on the west side of the United States, but we're on the east side of the, the Pacific, and we're in the northeast corner of that large chunk of water out there. Um, they're vulnerable because of their small population and their low reproductive uh, rates, and they're also dependency on the rocky shoreline and for, um, uh, that is being impacted by, by humans, by climate change, acidification, a whole variety of things. I'll mention that a little bit later here. But there are species that is designated uh, as a federal species of conservation concern. That's a notch below threatened and endangered. Uh, they're also declared a species of special status, uh, special status species in both the shorebird conservation plans for Mexico, the United States, and Canada. Uh, their population has always been looked as being in British Columbia. They range from the Bering Straits down to the middle of Baja. And it's always thought that the main portion of their population was in Alaska and British Columbia. But based on our studies, we're beginning to find out that uh, the California population, 1,100 miles of California population, may be a much more critical uh, part of the black oyster catcher range. We've got an estimate uh, of more than, uh, could be more than 4,500. That may be a little bit high. I think it's more like 3,500. Uh, number, but that's what's in California. Uh, the whole range is only 12 to 18,000. For shorebirds, that is really, really low. But this is a species that is a little different than most shorebirds, and the shorebird biologists really don't know what to do with this species because it doesn't migrate quite the way that a lot of shorebirds uh, migrate, particularly you think of those that come from Central America, South America, go all the way up into the tundra and back. That's quite a migratory route. Central Coast, most of them are here locally, all year round. Interesting. If you're up in uh, the Bering Straits in Alaska, they may go back into, uh, they leave their breeding territories in the, uh, 
the end of the breeding season and will go back into the rivers and the estuaries, maybe as much as, maybe as, much as 100 miles away from their uh, breeding territory, unlike the central coast here where they stay there. Uh, this is, it makes, makes it an interesting species to monitor, and we can monitor, and we are monitoring it year-round. Um, the numbers were, that we did was done in 2011. We did a, uh, we covered about 18% of the rocky habitat. But I say we, it was a whole bunch of volunteers, a wide variety of people, some which have never even looked at a black oyster catcher before, uh, didn't even know where to look for them, don't know whether they're counting, seeing a pair, and, and they see it again and counting a devil. So we're not sure what the, I, I think this, this one-time snapshot has some inconsistencies with it. Um, but they pulled it together, the biostatistician, uh, some biostatisticians worked on it along with some of the biologists who were monitoring at the time and published an article in marine uh, ornithology that said we may have as much as 6,000. Then they said, well, maybe it's 3,000. Um, we've knocked that number down, the numbers, that same group that published this, down to 35 to 4,500 or maybe more. Um, and if that's the case, you've got the California population being as much as 20% of the total population, maybe as high as a third or more. So it makes the pop California population much more significant than they thought before. But before we go any further, let's take a closer look at the black oyster catchers. That's the bird with a bright uh, reddish-orange beak, uh, a matching eye ring, a bright orangish-yellow iris. As I mentioned, in other oyster catcher species, sometimes they're eye ring and their irises are different colors. But that's what these, this is, a, I think, is a unique uh, trait. Um, one thing I like to say, the black oyster catchers are not really black. They have a, uh, a black head and a black um, nape, or what I really call black hood and a black uh, bib. Uh, the majority of the oyster catchers feathers are a dark brown. Depending on the sunlight, they can look black. Um, but they are a dark brown. They can look very light in some photos. And the black oyster catchers don't eat oysters. <laughs> that was a, uh, again, the species. The American oyster catcher is in a sandy habitat. Black oyster catchers in a rocky habitat. So they're primarily eating shellfish. They're eating limpids, wide variety of limpids available to them, uh, mussels, uh, but just about anything that moves in the rocky, upper rocky intertidal. They are, just need to think about this bird, the size of a crow, as some kids said, oh, that's a, that's a black bird eating a carrot. <laughs> um, but, but this bird is, think about it as the top predator in the rocky intertidal. They're eating uh, not only all the shellfish that's there, they're eating uh, small um, crabs, they eat marine worms, isopods, a variety of things there. Primarily limpids here, but they'll eat all things in the upper rocky intertidal. However, in the terrestrial environment, their eggs, their chicks, are food for other species. So, cycle goes around there. They are a very territorial bird. They will uh, they maintain their territory, the good territories here year-round, chasing out other black oyster catchers. A lot of uh, those are, you walk along the coast and you hear oyster catchers say, oh, that's that noisy bird. Well, a noisy bird is chasing other oyster catchers out of its territory most of the time. When they, they um, are chasing it, it's very loud and very consistent. They will tell their neighbors even, they'll get together with their neighbors and see where's the line? Where's our territory boundary? This pair um, actually moved that upper one up a, up a step and they said, is this the line? When they agreed, they flew back into their territories. <laughs> but while they're doing that, they're making a lot of noise. They're, they're going up and down like a pump jack on, a, uh, on an oil well. I mean, they go up and down, up and down with all the noise and they're their tail feather will be sticking up. Uh, it's really identifiable. A little different than when they do their greeting call. Sounds somewhat similar, a lot shorter, and it kind of tapers off nice and quietly. And they're obviously not as stressed. They're not uh, 
not going up and down as much, and they're not sticking their tail feather up, but it's really, there is a difference. We've noticed in vocalization that there's probably at least a dozen different uh, vocalizations that we can identify from greeting, from territorial calls, from passing calls, from calls for chicks, even a, oh, and a, a alert, alert calls and alarm calls. When you hear a drone around, I've been driving by um, at Point Pinos with a, my window down listening, and I could hear a stress call, and I knew, an alarm call, I knew exactly what that meant. There was a drone in the air, and they dislike drones. That's a whole other story. But uh, they occupy, again, the rocky habitat, which means this is where they nest. They nest on the uh, rocky cliffs. They nest on offshore rocks. In reality, they're really nearshore rocks, a lot of which can be accessed uh, at low tide. And they occasionally nest um, onshore, depending on the territory that they, they have. Most of the ones here, uh, we're dealing with at least 40% that nest on offshore rocks, 46 maybe, 45% that nest on uh, offshore rocks, others that nest on cliffs, and a small percentage, probably around 6%, may nest on, on the beach, or I should say rocky beaches. In this particular one, what we found is that that most nesting is between two to four meters above uh, the water line. And on uh, this particular rock, there's where they're nesting. And what's their nest? Their nest is really just a platform of, of pebbles that they toss on, if they can find them, to build a platform that looks like, looks like this. Shell, piece of shell if they have available. But mainly it's pebbles. They'll build that flat platform and they'll lay eggs. And although in Alaska, the literature in Alaska and, and uh, British Columbia, they've recorded four to five eggs, we've never seen more than three eggs. It's normally one to three eggs uh, here. So the last 12 years in the, in the Monterey region, three eggs is max, two eggs is about the average. These are eggs that are about the size of a chicken egg. They're greenish in color greenish tan, as opposed to a uh, western gull's egg that's more of a tan, and they look somewhat similar, but the nests are entirely different. You'll never, you won't find a western gull nesting on something like this. The um, oyster catchers uh, take about 26 to 32 um, days to, to incubate. I think it's a little shorter because it takes an oyster catcher at least 24 hours when they lay the first egg till they lay maybe their second egg. So it takes maybe 24 hours before they, they nest. They don't lay their eggs all at one time. Uh, if they're going to have a clutch of three eggs, like this one, um, that may have taken them three to five days before they do full incubation. They may be brooding, sitting on top of it, uh, keeping it from getting too hot or keeping it from getting too cold, but they're not incubating it until uh, they have their full clutch. How they decide whether they're doing two or doing three, or in some cases one, we don't know. Uh, but they switch off, male and females uh, both to incubate. There's always a bird on, most of the time, unless they're out after an interloper, that is on the nest. When one's ready to get off, the other one uh, comes and gets on, ranges the eggs the way they would like them, and sits there until it's time to exchange again. Time? Depends. They're sitting in the hot sun. I see it less than 15 minutes. On a cold, windy, foggy day, I've seen one sitting on the on a nest for two hours. The, male, the partner came in and wanted to, wanted to uh, incubate. It, it's part of, it wouldn't get off the nest. It said, it's nice and comfortable here. You stay out. I'm going to stay on it. So there really isn't a set time, but they will keep the eggs incubated. Um, when they, one of the reasons that they don't incubate until they have the full clutch is they want the eggs to hatch within about an hour of each other. And in this case, uh, I find it interesting, they're actually exchanging. One's been on this, one's just moving off. 
Um, you have this bird that's hatched, and within an hour, this one's beginning to hatch, and then this was the last one to hatch. The last one to hatch got about halfway out, and the partner or the uh, parent said, you're moving too slow, reached down, grabbed the egg, put it up about 15 centimeters, about six inches up, and dropped the chick out onto the nest. <laughs> and then it flew off with the egg. And what it does is getting the egg off the, off the nesting site for the scent to, to keep predators from uh, coming onto the nest. They'll drop it in the water, or they'll drop it uh, uh, on the shore some ways away. We were collecting uh, DNA samples. We were collecting eggs and other things. And I'm watching this happen, and it came and dropped it about uh, over here in the corner, about this close. It's only like it said, here's the egg if you want it. <laughs> it was just odd. I watched them drop one of them into the water, and the other one came and dropped it within uh, less than you know, five meters from where I was. Uh, when they hatch, they're this little ball of fur, little ball of fluff. And they, but they have, you can see, nice sturdy legs. Once they dry out from hatching, within an hour or so, they're, they're mobile. They can move around. They'll uh, look like this. Here's one that's uh, about, a, uh, about a day or two old, but still the fluff. Uh, it still has its egg beak on there, the beak to try to get it out. And it's just beginning the orange to show up there. Once it's uh, about a week old, that's what this is, you can see the orange starting to come out. Uh, it's still, the legs are getting a little bit longer. But it's, it's also adventurous, this particular one, as a lot of them will do. This was a good 30 meters away from where it was hatched. They don't necessarily have to go back to the, to the nest site. It depends on where the uh, parents want to uh, brood them at night, keep them protected. But this guy was moving around uh, a little concerned I had because there was a, a um, red-shouldered hawk in the cypress right around kind of keeping an eye on him. The next day, he was gone. That happens. That's the problem, is that these become food for other, other species. Um, this guy was adventurous, and a little too adventurous, I think. When they start, in this case, about uh, two weeks old, you see the one in the back blending in there, but nice longer legs. The uh, beak is growing out. You can still see the remnant of the, of the chick beak there. Uh, when they're about three weeks old, you see the feathers coming in, the fluff disappearing, the orange really coming in, you can see a remnant of the iris uh, starting to turn orange. And by the time they fledge, by the time they fly, uh, and again, that may take uh, anywhere between um, 36 to 42 days for them to get to a point where they can fly. Um, before that, they'll wander around. Follow. If they can, they'll follow the parents. Sometimes they can't come where the, the nesting site is. Uh, so the parents are having to continuously bring food to them. But when they're ready to fledge, this one's just about ready to fledge. Its tail feathers have grown out, uh, and it looks like it's about ready to fly. You can see a little bit of fluff on the back of its head. You can see how long its beak is, uh, fully uh, extended, and it has nice orange. And I think in this case, I'd say a she, and I'll mention that. The, well, I'll mention that it's a slender. One of the ways... Smaller, slender beaks are sometimes females, and a more robust one are males, but you really can't tell that unless you really measure them. Um, like this may be a male right here. But once it's fledgling, one time we can tell a fledgling from a sub-adult, adult that has gone through its full molting, and it loses its first set of feathers, uh, then it becomes a sub-adult, at least in oyster catcher world. But the beak itself will stay, it'll continue to grow out. The remnant will be there. It could be there as much as 18 months or even longer. But 18 months, it may take at least before that to get fully orange. The uh, eye rings are beginning to show up, and it may take um, a good year before those are totally uh, orange. And the iris, as you can see on this one, looks a... Um, a little pale, uh, a light green yellow, but it also, before it's even younger, it, uh, it's all black, and then it gets to be a very uh, dark uh, greenish or color, and then a lighter green until it eventually, eventually becomes nice and bright iris. 
The other one are buffy tips on almost all their feathers. This picture has some, some water on the back of the, uh, of the black oyster catcher here. But if you can see the buffy tips in the fledgling in the front here with the adult, those uh, are a really good indicator if you're trying to figure, is this a subadult or is this a fledgling? That's obviously fledgling because it has buffy tips. Um, some subadults still have their, their beak still with their uh, dark remnant in it. But they have to spend uh, a good, ideally, two to three months with their parents after they, even they fledge to even pick up the skills to allow them to go out on their, their own. This is a pair, the two adults are on the, the right, where they had three fledglings, kept them busy trying to feed these. And when they'd go off to try to feed the, the adults, the fledglings, because they can fly, would follow them and try to get their food. And so I watched them chase, keep chasing the fledgling. You go to another part of, you go practice in another part of the territory. If they happen to stay around late, and I've seen only in one case, but I've seen it as late as February, where the adults will then chase them out of the territory. Uh, so I've also seen uh, sub, um, fledglings leave within the first month. <coughs> they left within in a month, and that's a very short time for an, o an oyster catcher to get the skills that it, uh, that it needs. They, uh, once they, <coughs> excuse me, once they leave, <coughs> they um, leave their parents, they still take three to four years to get the skills they need to be a full functioning black oyster catcher. <coughs> and that's, that's quite, a, quite a time frame. A lot of birds don't take that kind of time. Oyster catchers do because they're in a very harsh environment and they've got to learn how to fend themselves, and they're, they're not in a position to, to be able to go out and take care of young until they get all those skills. But once they get those skills, and they're able to do that, fourth or fifth year, they've got to find a mate. They also have to get used to that mate. And sometimes you'll see some we call a neutral zone area where it's not a territory where there's a number of oyster catchers, there's sub-adults, there's old adults, adults there, maybe a young pair and they're working together, uh, learning to, to be with each other, or they find a territory, and they may spend the first year defending that territory and working to be with each other. But finding that territory is not easy because all the prime territories are taken. Um, a lot of times they'll move in on the soft spots between, between territories, where territories come together where it's further away from uh, the pair to have to... Uh, the current pair to have to chase them out. And sometimes you'll see hassles going on for uh, weeks. Um, that's it for what, at least an oyster catcher. But a quick thing on the oyster catcher project. This is a project that was originally initiated when the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service in Alaska thought that this species should be listed as a threatened and endangered species. But they didn't know enough about the whole range, uh, particularly 1,100 miles of the California coast. So we got with California Audubon, and we started the project at that time, 2011. We did uh, following protocol developed in Oregon and Washington, where we covered the 18% of the rocky habitat. And based on that, we did at least got a census number. Um, but uh, now it's being coordinated by local organizations, local chapters. Here in the Central Coast and Monterey Bay uh, region, we've got it under Monterey Audubon. And it's a community science uh, effort with the California Coastal National Monument, which, by the way, is more than 20,000 offshore rocks from San Diego to the Oregon border, and six onshore units, including like Rainer Pages Blanca's lighthouse down south and uh, Coast Dairies property up north of Santa Cruz, and a number of them up, uh, the, up in uh, Mendocino and uh, Humboldt County. Um, the uh, uh, project also involves docents at uh, Point Lobos, but 
being part of the Coastwide Project, initially they had four objectives. They made it more sophisticated when they did a publication, but I like the simpler version of it here. It's really to identify uh, the distribution and number, to really get a handle on the number of oyster catchers in California. 2011, the only snapshot. Wanted to do it again in 2005. They said, well, we don't have enough time to get focused on other things. This was, this was uh, California Audubon. But we'll do it at the end of it. We'll do it in 2000, at the end of our 10-year project. Well, that time they really were focusing on other things. So we don't have that. I'm going to try. We're trying to get another snapshot for the whole coast, but uh, um, we haven't been able to pull that off yet. The other one is determine. This is what we do with our monitoring. We're determining the reproductive success, and that's the number of fledglings from breeding pairs. We're also, while we're monitoring, is assessing. What are the threats in that habitat that uh, are causing nest failures? What's going on out there that uh, may be a problem? And developing conservation members, measures, what are some protective things we could do, or outreach initiatives that we could do that uh, may help uh, protect the, uh, the nesting activity. It's also looking at expanding the project to uh, the community science aspect to bring in more volunteers and um, other organizations over the long term for our monitoring effort. The other areas, San Luis Obispo, south end here, the central coast, our Monterey section, um, the uh, San Francisco Bay one, that's a small one, that's sort of iffy sometimes, uh, a nice initiative going on with the northern Sonoma coast and uh, the Central Coast was the Mendocino Coast Audubon. Their initiative up there is about the size of ours down here in Monterey, which are the two largest ones. Our region goes from the south end of Monterey, of a Point Lobo State Natural Reserve to the north end of Pescadero State Beach in uh, Mendocino County. We have two study areas, the Monterey Bay South Coast and the Monterey Bay North Coast. The North Coast, as each of our study areas are broken into monitoring sections, has two monitoring sections. One, Santa Cruz, uh, goes from Natural Bridges all the way to Greyhound Rock just before the county line. And then the southern end of the Monterey County coast, which focuses around the, the oyster catchers at uh, Pigeon Point Lighthouse and at Pescadero. The South Coast, we have three monitoring sections. One, the Monterey Peninsula from uh, Coast Guard Pier to the end of the Rocky Habitat at uh, Asilomar. We cover all of that, all the territories, 100% of that's covered. We have Pebble Beach from Point Joe to uh, the east side of uh, Stillwater Cove, where we have about the same number of territories as we do in Monterey, but because of some large private homes and things like the Cypress, uh, golf course, we can't get in to monitor those, but we still have a good sample there. And then Point Lobos, where we cover all of the, the reserve and have an equal sample to uh, that we have in Pebble Beach and with uh, Monterey Peninsula. So how do we monitor? We've been doing it for 12 years. So the first 10 years was uh, completed in 2021, and that was under Audubon. Uh, California, and we finished uh, last year the first two years of a continuing 10-year study that is now under uh, local Audubon Society chapters and local entities. We uh, monitor, while well, we're out there, we're monitoring for eggs and incubation, so we monitor that, whether they're still incubating. Um, we monitor for chicks and chick success, but also chick failure, which uh, as a problem the first year when a whole bunch of folks were monitoring and their nests failed, they got so attached to the chicks, they didn't want to come back the next year. So we had to do some quick adjustments um, in the following year after that. But uh, um, we also, or important things, the chick fledgling, the ones, that, the ones that can fly, and then re-nesting attempts or uh, replacement clutches. That's what we're looking for. We monitor weekly. Uh, during the breeding season, which is from mid-April to mid-September, uh, and a, each of the territories at least once uh, during that time. We have monitors that are out there every day sometimes, so, so for their 
that's fine. But at a minimum, we're looking at least once a, uh, once a week for at least 30 to 60 minutes. And that depends on what's going on out there. It depends how difficult it is to get into the sites. Here, particularly in the, uh, in the Monterey Peninsula, it's probably the easiest place to monitor because you've got the recreation trail around there. You've got the Silomar. Um, Point Lobos is great because you can get all the way around most of it. Um, but still, there's problems like at uh, Point Lobos, uh, at uh, uh, this particular rock, at Gillamont Rock, if they're not nesting on this side, you can't find them on that side. There's really no way to get over there. So that gets to be a problem. So there's little problems like that. But we, uh, we look for black oyster activity, and it, they'll, they'll tell us what they're doing. Um, we, at the end of each of our day, or at least within 48 hours, ideally, after we record it, and we record what we see with notebooks or some with their recorders, with their phone, um, we enter this in a Google Sheet, and we'll enter the uh, who's doing, who's entering it, when they started, when they finished, um, what's going on with the uh, um, behavior of the, the adults and where they are, if they're nesting, are they incubating, have they, have, they have chicks, are they, has the nest failed, and so on, and keeping notes. But we have Google Sheets that goes on uh, for the uh, entire breeding season. We also are doing this for non-breeding season as well, but we have this for every one of our um, our territories. Forgot to mention that our monitoring sections are made up of uh, black oyster catcher territories, which they define for us. They define where their territories are. Um, and so each of the territories, like this is one territory, we'll have this for what happened on that day and what happened the next day or what happened that morning, what happened that afternoon, depending on who's recording. Um, so what do we do with the data? I, during the breeding season, during May through September, I'll do a quick uh, a status summary. Not necessarily so quick. It takes us a while to put this together, but it's where we are. What do we know at that end of the season? What's happening at that end of the uh, of the month? What's happening for each of the the um, monitoring sections? And each of those MP numbers are for Monterey Peninsula, and each of those are territories. And you can see uh, this is near the end of September. How many failed during that time? Um, you can see how many uh, um, total fledglings we had in this particular year, uh, two um, out of uh, uh, 29 eggs and 10 known chicks. I mean, that's the kind of thing we get. But that becomes important information for us in looking at the success or problems related to the species. The end of the year, we put together an annual report. This is the cover of last year's report. We have all 12 of those, and all 12 of those are available on the Monterey Audubon website. You can go there immediately, find the Black Oyster Catcher program at the bottom of that. You can click on any of these and get, uh, get the report. You can read it then, or you can download it as a, a PDF. So all 12 of those reports are there. Um, we also do what's known as the EYES report, end of the year survey, where we're entering data uh, prepared at the end of, uh, end of the breeding season, and we do it in all five of the regions, and we're using an online uh, forum that kind of summarizes what happened in that particular breeding pair, because it's breeding pairs only, and if they, this breeding pair has a nest failure and nests again, and we'll do another, another form. So we do one for each of the nesting attempts. And that data are housed with the, the marine program, this multi-agency Rocky Intertidal uh, network that is uh, housed at uh, UC uh, Santa Cruz. So what does this tell us? So if we started the first year in 2012, when we were just beginning. And if you noticed, we're not anywhere. We haven't done anything in the North Coast. In fact, when we started this, we were simply doing Monterey County and even went down into Big Sur. I just pulled the stuff out uh, that was appropriate that fits what we now call uh, our monitoring um, sections and put those numbers in there. Oops, hit the wrong thing. Um, and it was 2013 when I had two interns out at Point Pinos and were, were monitoring. I looked around and there was on either side of my monitoring section, there weren't anybody. I contacted Audubon and said, what happened? And 
They said, uh, our monitors quit on us because they couldn't stand another season losing chicks. So when I do the training, I make it very clear. You're going to lose chicks. You're going to lose a nest. You're going to lose eggs. You're going to lose chicks. Um, but you may get re-nesting, and you may get some results from it. So our 2013 is pretty slim. So 2014 gives us a little more robust sample. Um, that was uh, where we uh, looked at at least part of our, what is now our San Mateo monitoring section. And why? Because we found an interesting situation. Only place we know this along the entire California coast. That particular rock had, at that time, in this rocky part of it right here, there were five nesting pairs right on top of each other. One of them was a pair we'd heard before that, boy, it's great. We see we had a pair up in Sonoma. They're, they're, they're uh, nesting 30 meters from each other. And that's really odd. Here we had ones for less about a meter from each other, meaning you had a rock that was about a meter high, a meter wide, and you had a nest on one side and a nest on the other side. And what do they do with their territories? They do this pie shape kind of thing. They come out from the rock and have their territories. If you're the unlucky one that's in the middle up there, that pair has to go all the way up to that top uh, polygon up there, and that's their uh, territory. They've got to go past and make noise and everything else to go past two other territories. So this is an interesting rock. I mean, it's an interesting one for us to monitor. That's, uh, that year, we ended up with we had five territorial pairs, not this year, but in 2000, uh, back, what am I, year am I talking about here? 2014, we had, we had the five pairs produced uh, eight fledglings. So that was, so we thought we'd keep an eye on that, and that got us up looking at the North Coast. And because I originally thought, whoops, excuse me, that I would throw in, if you look, uh, 2015, we added Pebble Beach up there that when I first said, let's compare the Monterey Peninsula with Point Lobos, should be a big difference. Peninsula is pretty open. Point Lobos with reserve, pretty controlled. The numbers were about the same. So I said, well, what happens if we look at the area in the middle, Pebble Beach, through that, it, the numbers are very similar as well. So what we found the South Coast has a lot of similarities, even though there's some differences, which I could discuss a little bit more, but they're between Point Lobos, for example, and uh, and Monterey Peninsula, and the kind of a combination of what's at Point Lobos and what's at Monterey Peninsula at uh, uh, Pebble Beach. But when we started 2015, because we were adding Pebble Beach, we didn't have time at that time. I didn't have the capability to get over on the north end. Now we've got to basically pay a biologist to get over there. Because uh, uh, it's not, other than close to Santa Cruz, there's nobody out there to, that uh, nobody wants to drive that far. Um, that's a, uh, from my house, that's a 100 mile round trip if I go out there. So, um, when we really started getting our numbers then, it was 2016. If you look at that, we got a pretty robust sample there. 2016, 17, uh, and so 16 is when we, when I, start, when I start talking about numbers, that's when we're starting. It's really that eight year block if we complete two more years, we'll have a 10 year, uh, pretty solid sample. But I always said it's taken us that, took us till 2016 to get where we have enough of a sample and we have well trained monitors that's, that provide consistency, which is really important uh, to uh, deal with all with this data. So we have that going all the way through till, till last year, and we'll continue again this year. So if we're looking at numbers just for the whole 12 years of fledglings, we're starting with just a couple, but it's, by the time we get 2016, you can see with a big enough robust sample that we're really dealing with uh, double figures and only with a bad year in 2021. And for some reason, well, that was a problem to all of us with the pandemic. For some reason, it was a problem with, with oyster catchers as well. Um, my feeling is we had a lot of people that went to the coast to, the way you get out during the pandemic was go to the coast. We had more people showing up the coast during that time, and I think that affected uh, black oyster catcher breeding. Um, our, what really is important to us is looking at the breeding pair to the uh, amount of fledglings. So again, that simple 
math of dividing uh, the uh, number of fledglings by the number of breeding pairs. And that gives us a whole series of numbers that the biologists refer to these instead of percentages, 0 0.1, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, or rounded out, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and so on. But this last year, look at this. This is, it was our best year for some reason. Heavy rains, I thought it was going to be terrible. Turned out to be our best, uh, best year of, of uh, 12 years of monitoring or just looking at our eight years from 2016. It still is a good year. So how does it look when we put it in a form of a bar graph? If you look at the light blue there, that's the north coast. The north coast is always the one that's been more and more productive. Look at the green. The green is the south coast. South coast is a little low in productivity compared to the north coast. Um, and I thought the north coast was going to go up. Then I started looking, and it really looked to me that we had a downward trend, particularly if you look at where we were most productive, that things were looking bleak until um, 2023, where things went up, and it looked like things may be a little different. But what is, you know, what does that data tell us? Well, you know, is this good, bad, or indifferent? The one thing that uh, Audubon did for us, National Audubon, with their biostatistician, was to look, uh, doing a literature search of um, the Alaska and primarily British Columbia data and put together an initial population model. I mean, he looked at a wide variety of things. He looked at um, various models that he played around with the data. But based on that, he came up with a model uh, that's looking at the breeding pair productivity. And again, by the way, this did not use any of our California data, um, but this is very useful. Uh, for if you have a sign of a good local population, it's going to be 0.65 and above. If you're looking at sign of caution or for a, a population at risk, you're looking at a point below 0.35. So how does that look when we Put it here. 0.35 runs across there. It looks like you've got some pretty decent years with uh, the uh, north coast. South coast, a little different. It's kind of hard to see it getting up there. But uh, there's the, the good side of things, and only the north coast seems to reach above that. If we do it in the form of a, a line graph, it looks like tangled wires there. But if we take them out and look at the north coast, you can see that Things went, uh, went up, and you had a drop here. Did anybody know what was going on in the North Coast in 2020? Anybody remember what was happening there when our skies were a little? We had a very big fire right there. Firing came down the coast and near some of the, uh, some of the nesting thing here. I, I think if, that was not, if it was not that big fire in, uh, uh, in Santa Cruz and San Mateo, and of course, that, little, that number would have been up and in line, but you still would have had a number going down. And it wasn't until, and still going down until 2022, and it wasn't until last year that it popped up uh, and above that. So it has some periods where it's being low, and even that one year we went down at risk. If you look at the south coast, this side of the bay, it's got up, down, a little valley, up, a big valley, uh, 2021, a lot of people came out to the coast and then um, shot up a little bit in 2021, but didn't get any further than, uh, didn't get above the red line. And only last year did it get up above the, uh, uh, at risk and still below the green line on the top. So if we put both of it together, which I think is much more indicative of the California coast, the article that um, they put together uh, looking at our data, I'll mention that in a moment. Um, I don't think it used any of this data. It should have used his, I don't, I have to see because they, they haven't given us the, the uh, they would give us a draft, I don't know why, us being the coordinators on the, on the coast to see how they used it, but I'm not sure they, they um, looked at the, uh, the model that was developed a few years earlier. Um, so we get past that, you see that only, only the North Coast gets above the uh, green line. Um, and 
looking at it this way, and I still kept thinking that way, but what they're doing, the article I was referring to, they've got an article that's been submitted, they, meaning Audubon biostatistician, along with some Audubon California folks, and our project uh, manager and project coordinator, uh, both were working on this and put, the, put together uh, not only the California data, but looking at the Oregon data. Oregon started this a couple years before we did. We've used their protocol. So it actually makes sense to look at that whole portion of the coast. One thing that uh, they did was break it into what I call our central coast, and that's uh, San Luis Obispo to San Francisco. They call it a region. I'll call it a section. Um, then the center, central section is from the northern part of Sonoma Coast to the southern part of Oregon, and then the northern part is northern Oregon. They looked at that, and what they, they found, looking at all that data, was one, that there was the productivity uh, went from lower to higher as you went up north, and I'd have to look at the data to see how much difference that really is. But I think the thing's interesting is they said that there's a lack of any temporal trend in productivity in any one of the regions of the subregion, like a subregion would be Monterey, our Monterey Bay region, and the whole re other region, that larger section I call Central Coast. Um, instead of being like this, when I, I just pull out the combination of data, this is the North Coast and the South Coast, and look at it, it there is no temporal trend there. That's right, it's not, it's, there's a down years, there's up years, down years, but I think what's interesting here, if you look at that, out of these eight years, half of those are at, up above or near the, um, the at risk and a couple below that. So the half of those are really at the risk, really at at risk level and none of them, not a single bar there in a single year, even last year, gets up to the uh, healthy population level. That's not a good sign. You advance this a bit. Oops. Um, so if you look at the, the data, again, one of the things that we see is that the, this is a population that needs to be watched because the only uh, successful thing was, was last year, and that's still not above the at-risk level. Um, we also look at about four of these being below that, as I mentioned, and the fact that um, last year was the closest we've come to the nearest to a healthy level still isn't, isn't the best thing to, to um, cover us. So one of the things, though, to keep in mind is that none of this is stable. Population stability is often really quite variable. And it's due to very, a whole number of circumstances, both in the environment and to human uh, influences. There are several factors that govern the the uh, vital rates or the abundance that uh, will change over time. I mean, for example, uh, ongoing sea level and temperature rises will likely change the availability of the intertidal habitat and the prey base for black oyster catchers. Acidification, silt and sanding, um, all of this um, can affect the food source for oyster catchers. The coastal development uh, and continual uh, human use and expanded human use on the coast. Uh, we'll have changes uh, in the, uh, will affect the predator uh, communities and likely have an impact on oyster catchers. There's a number of pluses and minuses in that, but that things are not, bound, not the same. They're not going to remain the same. And the sea level rise and climate change it's definitely going to limit the nesting and roosting options. There's not going to be the ability for oyster catchers to keep up with new nesting sites uh, under change of sea level rise under climate change. That's, that's going to create problems. So what do we need? We need, uh, uh, we need to continue to um, look at the data. We need to continue our monitoring. We need consistent monitoring. Uh, so that's important. We need to complete our eight years or our current 10-year monitoring project because that'll give us a better, longer trend model and something to look at. 
Uh, we need to update the uh, current model because it didn't use some of the detailed site-specific information on oyster catchers that, uh, that's now available. And we need to keep uh, an eye on and keep data for climate change, sea level rise, coastal development, coastal access, and a whole bunch of other factors that are going to affect the habitat and the productivity of the oyster catchers. Uh, we need to also encourage uh, much future analysis, particularly potential graduate students to be able to use our data to be able to um, look at the population variables and to help us uh, with the perpetuation, uh, understanding and a perpetuation of the species. Um, the question is, is all this sustainable? Always ask that. Um, when you have increased uh, population use, that's at a point, uh, Pinos, right there. Uh, it used to not look that way. It sure does now when you're out there a lot. Um, when you're dealing with climate change and sea level rise, it's going to affect uh, oyster catchers, definitely. And it's going to influence where they're nesting and where they're uh, able to roost. It's going to bring in other species in to roost in their nesting areas. and It's, uh, it's going to get interesting for these guys. So with that, I'm going to keep from running out of uh, voice here and deal with any questions, see what kind of time we have here. What was the question? How far do the fledglings disperse? Are they squeezing into the same territory with their parents? No, no. They, one is they leave. They leave. And we don't have, um, we don't have a banding program. That was a whole other thing we discussed and the problems with smaller population and not getting a big enough thing. Uh, but we have tracked, for example, um, there were two fledglings that, uh, that were at, at um, the cove in, uh, at the Hopkins Marine Station, that while they were growing, just before they fledged, and their first month of fledgling, there was a territorial pair trying to move in on their parents. So their parents was doing, were doing battle with this uh, um, interloping pair until they finally took them two months to chase them out. Uh, but we watched that fledgling pair, because there were two of them, easy to to identify, I wonder if I even have this picture here. Yeah, one's up there in the upper right-hand corner. That pair was easy to identify because they're always moving and working with each other. We watched them move all the way around to the, to the west, around Point Pinos, head south, and then disappear in the Silmar. Once you get beyond Point Joe, there's a nice little, we call a neutral zone, where a lot of oyster catchers hang out. I'm assuming they may have ended up there but, or something like that, where they can hang out with other oyster catchers until they get the skills. We don't know how far they go. We did have a banded oyster catcher show up in 2014 that was banded three years before that in um, the Fairline Islands. 90 miles north is the oyster catcher flies. That oyster catcher obviously moved, it, moved along the coast until it ended up uh, down here and was... Uh, Happy to hang out here for a while. I mentioned divorced. We watched her get divorced. <laughs> she finally got a partner, tried two quick nesting uh, failures in the same season, and next thing you know, her male is hanging out with another female in that territory, and she's two territories away trying to hang out, check it out, never worked, with another, another male. Um, but so we know those kind of dynamics happen, but we don't have enough uh, ways to observe that. But anyway, that interesting question. So we don't know how far they go, but 90 miles away or more um, is a real possibility. Any other questions? Yes? How long do the uh, adults live and, and what predators do they have? You know, it's interesting. The adults have few predators. They're, um, we've got reports of uh, at least like a ranger at a, at Asilomar years ago, uh, excuse me, at uh, Point Pinos years ago, uh, eating lunch and seeing a, a raptor, must have been a peregrine falcon, come right down, 
hit a boy, grab it, take it off. So, and that's about the only time we have uh, documentation of anything happened to the adults. Anything younger than an adult uh, is open to all kinds of problems. The, um, the predators that we have, uh, oh, by the way, how long do they live? Study done, the fair line said um, nine to 15 years. Studies with banded oyster catchers in uh, British Columbia has reports of 25 in Alaska, um, uh, 20. I think we're dealing with 15 to 20 years for a lifespan. The, the uh, terrestrial environment for their nests have all kinds of predators. Uh, you've got skunks, you've got um, weasels. We even have a documentation of American mink in the cove right at, uh, uh, at Hopkins uh, in there. And we, uh, Amanda had put a, uh, a trail cam up on a pair and a silomar, attached it to a 50 pound rock, attached it in a metal case, casing and hard to get to and hard to move. She has pictures of somebody trying to take it. <laughs> that didn't happen. But, and we don't have any predation documented on that one because the, that time we had what, two uh, fledglings we had. But we picked up raccoons out on the rock, which we knew went out there, but now we've got that documented. And coyotes, we knew uh, we, they went out there. They're out on the rocks. I mean, I was there one day. Um, I'd been out at Point Pinos with uh, monitoring a, a fledgling and uh, not a fledgling, excuse me, a young chick just about to fledge. And the next morning I went out and there's no human tracks going out on the islet, but there's a canine track going out and coming back and there's no chick. So a lot of things get, get to them, get to the eggs. They, they always blame uh, the eggs on the uh, western gulls and, and on corvids, uh, crows and and ravens, but uh, where that is, yes, they do take them, but I think a lot of the eggs are taken by a, uh, a whole bunch of other species as well. Any other questions? You were asking me about, um, about how do we determine males and females, right? And if you were asking that, let me uh, jump ahead of here and find that. <coughs> Oyster catchers are uh, morphologically, um, they look about the same, but the female is a couple centimeters bigger than a male. You can't tell that out there. It's got a pair standing here. It's hard to tell, uh, tell that pair. You, you can look at, I mentioned the beaks. See, this, this guy in the front's got a nice thicker beak and a little more a thinner one in the back, but that's somewhat arbitrary. It's hard to tell. But at least, fortunately, in 2008, there was a publication on uh, looking at irises and be able to determine the sex of a black oyster catcher. So in that publication, you have the um, iris. See, you can see the pupil there, very clear. That's in the top category, that's all male. Second category with a slight fleck, a little bit of fleck or a speck on the eye, that's also a male, but the females have a much bigger, darker speck. Why? I'm not really sure. Um, and I still think that's a, that's a remnant of, because when they're young, they've got a black iris. And I think as that begins to, to um, form into the yellow iris, for some reason with the females, you can leave a remnant of it still there as a speck. And so if you look at, our standing pair. Again, you can see the male with a round eye and, and the female with a speck that looks like an old skeleton key hole. And uh, you can look at this pair, easily see a nice little photo that Rick Parsons took. Um, you can see the, the male and the female. The only way we know these sometimes is by taking a picture and blowing it up and looking at it. Or if you have a spotting scope, which we ask everybody really to use, you sometimes can hone in on but Oyster catchers will move around. But when you get used to it, we can tell that. We can tell a male. Here's a slight speck on the guy on the, on the uh, bird on the right, and the bird on the left, uh, that kind of keyhole look. So those are uh, 
those are the difference. The, the uh, female looking this way and the male like that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but OK. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, this is a very difficult one. Jan could probably tell you more specifics than I can, because Jan, working with International Bird Rescue, uh, dealt with it. But they they do not uh, they do not do well in captivity. Uh, if you look at the ones at the aquarium, they've had problems. They had to take them out of, particularly during the breeding season, they had to take them out with the uh, shorebirds, uh, seabirds. They had them in there because they started chasing around the puffins and everything else. Um, you had the female, if you notice, the one that was in the, uh, in the uh, shorebird exhibit there. It got nasty as it got older and started hassling all the other shorebirds in that. And they had to create a space for it, to basically put it in a, um, isolated confinement. Uh, it's over beyond the bat rays in a separate little area where she's living out her life. But... The aquarium says they're extremely difficult to, to take care of. Um, and also feeding it out of certain kind of food for them, the lipids and others. In captivity, we had somebody who, somebody who captured, who found a chick and brought it into um, um, to, uh, the SPCA wildlife for here in Monterey. And they uh, said the chick, we need to, hard to raise, so they passed it on to, to the uh, International Bird Rescue folks, who spent a lot of time raising it until it was, until it was it's fledged, until it could fly. And they wanted to know whether they could turn it loose. Well, first of all, so you've got the gist of what I was talking about with oyster catchers. They're very territorial. And if it's not their chick, they'll chase it out. They'll cause uh, problems. So we thought, well, if you want to try it, we'll try the neutral zone. And that, that was the one south of Point Joe, or south of China Rock, between Bird Rock in, uh, and Pebble Beach and China Rock. And we knew we had some fledglings in there. We had some uh, sub-adults. So one afternoon, <laughs> evening, or morning, early morning, I guess it was, we went to... Uh, Turn this bird into the wild. Um, it didn't want to go anywhere. It didn't want to leave the box it was in. Finally, I had to put it out on the rack, out on, the, out on the water on a rock, and pull, uh, pull it out or pull the box away from it, the carrying box it was in, and just leave it sitting there. And it just wanted it to know what to do. It started calling. It started doing its call. And it attracted a couple oyster catchers that were in there. It attracted a, a, a male and attracted a um, sub-adult. And the sub-adult, what was that? First the male went over to see what it was doing and it freaked because here's another, here's an, another oyster catcher. Sub-adult went after it. It said, you know, this is my territory. I mean, he's practicing. So he went after this bird. Didn't know Normally, when a oyster catcher uh, is being chased, or it will go along the coast. They don't leave that little band of rocky intertidal. They don't go inland very far. They'll, they'll, even when they fly, they don't do that. This bird went straight towards the road. <laughs> he went out of there, and he, fortunately, he pulled, landed right in the brush about from here to that display case from the road where he would have gone. We went and grabbed him, put him back in a box, and sent him back to um, International Bird Rescue. And it took us how many months to find a place that was willing to take an oyster catcher? We found a place in New Orleans that does, or in Louisiana anyway, that does uh, birds. They had an American oyster catcher, a black oyster catcher, in a big aviary space. and. That's where it went, and as far as we know, did okay. But 
Anyway, they don't do well in captivity, they, which, which means that we're trying to breed them or plant. There, there's so much they have to learn on that coast. This bird that we lose knew absolutely nothing, zero. It would have been gone in a, a day or two. Um, so it was better than that. But it, it's interesting. This is a bird that has to, um, has to uh, learn a lot for it to survive in that really harsh habitat. An environment that they live in. <coughs> Any other questions? It's probably good for some of you. Oh, yes. How do they get past the shell of their food? Excuse me? Their, their food is generally some kind oh, of... Oh, yes. How do they get past the shell? Yeah, this, this is what makes it... This beak that they have, that's their tool. That's double... Uh, it's uh, cartilage like in your fingernail. And it's, it's double, so it's... Thick. There's there's two there's two shells in there that they can get in. They'll go in. Let's use a limpet. They'll where we would need a limpet. By the way, has an attachment. Somebody did a study one time, and I, somebody told me about the article. And I haven't seen the article, but they were studying glue. And they said that's the, the some of the world's strongest glue. They hold on there a limpet. So, but we need a hammer and a chisel to pop a limpet off a, a rock. They can go with their bill in there just really quickly, pop it off, go in and cut the, the inside of the attachment, the muscle that's attached to the shell, cut it off, grab the meat, toss the shell on, go and find another one. Just watch them do that after, one after another. Uh, it looks like they're doing every time they get one, but you watch it, and I'd say about every 12th time um, they actually successfully get something. But for, for a muscle, particularly, they'll they like it's wet, they'll go in, when it's wet, it'll open a little bit, they'll go right in there, they'll pry that open, cut the muscle, pull the meat out, uh, and, um, and they're on their way. They, they, use, they feed their young a lot. They'll feed owl limpids around here, seems to be the thing, the first uh, week, and then uh, almost, almost exclusively muscle while they're raising their, uh, their young. They'll feed the young muscle until they get a little bit older, they even bring in small crabs and things. I watched a little one getting greedy and try to small before the, a crab before the, uh, the parent broke it up and watch this little chick trying to swallow this crab and its neck getting bigger and its <laughs> crab feet sticking out and it finally got it in there but it almost choked itself. Um, but it's that tool. They got the ability to get in there uh, and uh, you know, survive in the rocky habitat with that tool. Something happens to that beak they're gone. That's, that's it. Um, that's really important. And it grows. It grows like your fingernails. So ones in captivity, like at the, uh, the aquarium here, they have to trim the beak. Because it, it's not here. These guys are hitting it against rocky habitat all day long, at least during. They, they forage during, uh, obviously, low tide. During high tides, they're, they're roosting. Um, but uh, yeah, and they'll do continue. They forage all, all day long during low tides, and we sometimes wonder if they do that at night as well. We don't know. Yes. What's your intuitive thoughts of uh, if we could ever get we'll think it'd be one way on the south lane, and turn the north lane to the habitat, along with getting rid of the ice plant and turning the clock lane. Do you think we're the best U.S. Um, I mean, my opinion, for example, on, uh, on uh, Ocean View Boulevard, yeah. uh, particularly Point Pinos, I think they just ought to close it off. Yeah. <laughs> Use it as a hiking yeah, trail. But the Coastal Commission doesn't like that, but there is a great chance of it getting one way. Yeah, there is, yes. And uh, just going on to that south thing. Yeah. Well, here's the... And then getting rid of the ice plant, like every other city in California. Right. And a lot of uh, the ice plant in the golf course area, they've, they've removed, when they removed that, they, they started a replanting natural habitat. They didn't need to do that. The seed base is there. The seed base all came back. I mean, all the natural stuff came back. But uh, let me just give the one little anecdotal thing that I think uh, is interesting. During the pandemic when um, 
things were closed. For a whole month, Point Lobos was closed. We could monitor because we weren't docents and we weren't, our docents couldn't, but we could, our staff, we, me and our two biologists. Um, so we could do that. And then there was, it was closed for a month because of fire. So two months during uh, uh, 2021, we were able to monitor when nobody else was out there. Uh, and the oyster catchers seemed to be doing okay. We also couldn't get out on uh, Hopkins Marine Station, where we had two nesting pairs at that time. So we couldn't monitor those. That particular year on the Monterey Peninsula, for example, we had one, uh, zero fledglings, and we had one fledgling on Point Lobos that year. Oh, excuse me, one, uh, one fledgling at Pebble Beach. At Point Lobos, where we normally had one, sometimes three, and the three were like that one I showed you there, where, the, where you have one pair that has three fledglings. Um, that year we had seven fledglings when nobody could go out there. They weren't even nesting in places that people walk. They tolerate people in, in uh, places like uh, um, uh, Weston Cove where people do tide pooling. And I, they, I think they tolerate me because to them, the people that are out there tide pooling are, are species. It looks like somebody's out there uh, feeding to them. If you're a photographer and you start going after them or towards them, you know, you're acting like you're hunting them. And they'll react that way. But we had, we had seven... Uh, oyster catcher uh, fledglings that year there were normally we have our average is about two. Um, we had zero in Point Lobos, but at the end of the season, October 1st, we see one fledgling um, just on the west side of, of uh, Lover's Point. And then we found two of them hanging out with a pair over near El Torito um, restaurant until the pair chased them out when it was time to forage. We did a little quick check with everybody to make sure there weren't any more, but we found the three were there. We, we docked, an interesting day we spent with everybody out looking for fledglings and, uh, and taking photos. We had three that I think the only place they could have come from was Hopkins when we couldn't go out there. So the places that we couldn't go produced 10 fledglings. Um, and in places where there aren't a lot of people. So the dynamic of just having a bunch of people around definitely affects them. Why we have more productivity up north, we have less people hassling them. Uh, down here, we have more people in their habitat. So anything that can be done to reduce the number of people along part of the coast would do that. Yeah. And keeping you here a little bit too long, unless any of you have a, anybody have any other questions? Thank you so much, Rick. Thank you. Thank you.